I am uh, Marino Sarigianis. I'm uh, welcoming you all uh, on behalf uh, of the Institute for Mediterranean Studies and uh, on behalf of uh, the director of the Institute, uh, Professor uh, Jelena Karalafis, who is, uh, had the last moment engagement in Berlin and couldn't uh, join us. Uh, so I will, I will not be long. We are very happy as an institute uh, to host uh, this uh, book launch of uh, the, this uh, magnificent uh, edition coordinated by uh, Lida Pastafanaki and uh, Erdem Kabadei, uh, working in Greece and Turkey, a comparative labor history from empires to national states, uh, 1840 to 1940. Uh, so I won't be long. I welcome you all. Uh, I will uh, uh, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, let's, uh, let us all be muted unless we want to talk so as not to have uh, echo problems. Uh, and I will uh, give the floor immediately. Uh, so I spoke on behalf of the Institute. So the other, uh, uh, the other two um, institutions involved uh, in this uh, event uh, the University of Johannin and the uh, Koch University. So I immediately give the floor to Associate Professor Marinella Papakistoforou from the, the Deputy Head of the Department of History and Archaeology of uh, the University of Ioannina. Thank you, Marinos. Uh, dear colleagues, dear members and friends of our academic community, I'm more than happy to welcome this virtual book launch on behalf of the Department of History and Archaeology of the University of Ioannina, but also as the director of the interdisciplinary postgraduate program in modern history, folklore and anthropology. I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting, as well as the two editors of Working in Greece and Turkey, Adam Kabadayi, Associate Professor of Economic History at Koch University of Istanbul, and Lida Papastefanaki, Associate Professor in Greek Economic and Social History at our university, for kindly inviting me to join today this international online company on the occasion of a wonderful publication. Congratulations to all contributors and to the two editors. Mrs. Papastefanaki, is a very dynamic member of our department, prolific and energetic, who along with her colleagues in modern Greek and European history, contributes decisively to the quality of under and postgraduate programs in historical and interdisciplinary studies at our department, along also with the establishment of the Laboratory for Historical Research of Modern and Contemporary Societies, which she coordinates creatively from the beginning of its operation. Mr. Kabadayi is also a political economist and historian with a long presence in several European universities and academic institutions, and especially acquainted with both the Ottoman Empire and its successor states. This is the third time that we welcome Erdem at our department. He has already offered us lectures in the framework of our postgraduate program in 2015 and in 2017, along with other historians from Turkey, in the framework of an international conference on labor history. The exact title, Labor History, Production, Markets, Relations, Policies. The volume launched today makes up an important publication in English published by Bergen Books and under the auspices of the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. In my view, we can certainly see it as part of a political context, not only as a challenging academic project, aiming to bridge space and time, tensions and conflicts for the post-Ottoman period in the wider Eastern Mediterranean and not only between our two beloved homelands, whose inhabitants have exchanged and continue to exchange cultural traits for thousands of years, like tastes, stories told, words and rhythms, but also commercial goods and production techniques, happily and harmoniously in peaceful times,
but also in turbulent circumstances when there is war, raids and conquerors. At the same time, this volume constitutes an important contribution to the history and historiography of labor in general, to the history from below. The 14 contributors of the volume, historians them all in terms of specialty, through a wide array of fields in social research, focus on the history of labor during this century of transition from empires to nation states. The topics of the 13 chapters of the collective volume, which is presented today, cover rural and urban milieu in both the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in both countries, political aspects of labor and the movements eventually related to them, but also subjective individual imprints. Uh, I think there is, okay, uh, there is a screen sharing, excuse me. So I was talking about the topics of the 13 chapters uh, that cover rural and urban milieus in both countries, political aspects of labor and the movements eventually related to them, but also subjective individual imprints of the working conditions for the same period in both countries. The essays of the volume are thus presented in three main parts according to those three axes. However, the reader can also spot combinations of additional topics that give the volume a special political, social and historical interest as the history of labor in that specific period and the relevant national and social environments is also linked to a number of nationalistic issues and concepts, dominant representations actually, that concern the national narrative on both sides along with its contradictions, religious identities and dominant political choices and strategies, or the feminist movement and gendered aspects of production, or the expression of a dominating patriarchy in the management of human resources. Those cases concerning more in general the Balkans and the Aegean shores. An excellent introduction by the two editors of the volume gives a detailed and critical review of the relevant historiographical research in the two countries since the 1980s for Greece and the mid 1950s for Turkey, essentially with the introduction of social and economic history studies in their academic worlds. The issues raised by the contributions of the volume are of great interest for the construction of modern societies on both shores, but also concern a wider range of ethnicities that coexisted within their geographical contexts, like the Armenians. The overall historical approach aims in a comparative synthesis, as the two editors point out both in the introductory chapter and the epilogue, and I quote from the latter. There remains a powerful challenge to deconstruct the nationalistic historiographical approaches on both sides of the Aegean by offering combinations of sources in Greek, Turkish and Ottoman languages and adopting a comparative perspective." End of quotation. The concordance between Turkish and Greek historiography can only promise us new challenging chapters in historical and social research from and for both sides. The volume we are holding in our hands, thanks to Lida and their dam, but also to its 12 other authors, has certainly achieved the goal set by the editors, that is to contribute to broader understandings and applications of labor history on both sides of the Aegean for the period 1840 to 1940, by presenting and also investigating lesser known aspects and issues in labor history. And herein lies, in my view, not only the originality, but also the pioneering character of this publication. I wish you the best of luck for the volume being launched today, but also for the routes that it opens up in social research. We are looking forward to the next step. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilena, and also welcome, uh, Suraya. 
a very long time uh, friend. Uh, so now I give the floor to Assist, Assistant Professor Kerem Tenaz, the coordinator of the Department of uh, History in uh, Kosh University, who will welcome us from the, uh, on behalf of uh, Kosh University. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kerem Tenaz. It's my privilege to welcome you all on behalf of the Kosh University History Department. We are here to celebrate the publication of the volume Working in Greece and Turkey, edited by professors Lida Papstefanaki and Erdem Kabadayi. It's also a great honor that so many of you join us today to talk about the volume's many contributions. So I will also keep my words uh, brief. Um, as a historian of the 19th century and uh, early 20th century, one of the things in this book that caught my attention was how the essays transcend divisive lines of national historiographies of the 20th century uh, by offering us a transnational and comparative perspective to labor history in the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, and uh, Greece. And the book uh, helps us think the region within the framework of uh, global labor history, which I believe is a timely and uh, much needed contribution to a region that is often studied within distinct national uh, historiographies. And in this sense, it was a, a pleasure to see that three of our colleagues here at Koch University History Department were part of this uh, scholarly work. Of course, as I mentioned already, Associate Professor Erdem Kavadeyi is one of the two editors of the volume. Uh, but I would also like to recognize the uh, contributions of Dr. Akin Sefer and Dr. Uh, Semih Celik to the working in Greece and uh, Turkey. Dr. Uh, Sefer and uh, Dr. Celik are postdoctoral uh, researchers at our uh, department. In, uh, in the previous years, they worked with Professor uh, Kabadaya in his ERC uh, project, Urban Occupations. And uh, currently they are uh, principal investigators of their own uh, Tubitak uh, projects. And uh, these contributions reminds us of the scope of the academic research at the Koch University History Department, which covers a broad geographical area with interest in different uh, subfields ranging from labor history, intellectual history, economic history, social history, political history, among many others. And uh, indeed, most of us in the department are interested in transnational and uh, comparative perspectives to reveal connections and influences between different cultural, social, and political trends, trends and uh, benefit from the findings, tools, and perspectives of various uh, subfields in uh, our disciplines. And these contributions resonate with many of our uh, colleagues, but also with our students, both graduate and undergraduate students. And I think more and more uh, we recognize uh, that cooperation with other scholars and institutions at the regional and the global level is essential to our uh, field and, uh, and craft. And uh, to conclude, I would like to congratulate once again, the editors, Professor Lida Papstefanaki and Professor uh, Erdem Kabadeye and to each of the contributors for this uh, stimulating work. I also would like to uh, thank Professor Sreya Faroki, Professor Socrates Petmezas, and Professor Jan Najar for joining us and accepting to share their uh, valuable insights and comments. And of course, to Profes uh, Professor uh, Marinos uh, Sirianis uh, for agreeing to act uh, as the panel's uh, channel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerem. Uh, although I'm not a professor, <laughs> I'm just a, a researcher. Uh, so uh, thank you all for the opening remarks. Uh, now I can, I think we can directly proceed to the book presentation uh, proper. So we have an excellent panel uh, uh, with the two editors, uh, Lida Pastafanaki and Mehmet Erdem Kabadai. We have Professor uh, Suraya Faroki, uh, Socrates Petmezas, and uh, Jan Najar. So a team of excellent uh, scholars, and the discussion promises to be uh, really interesting and fruitful. Uh, so I will just directly give the floor to, to Lisa, also a member of the Institute, uh, and who 
came from the, from uh, Crete. She studied history at the University of Crete, and uh, today she's an associate professor of economic and social history uh, at the University of Ioannina in the Department of History and Archaeology, and the collaborating faculty member of uh, the institute. And uh, she has several studies on the social and economic history of uh, especially industrialization and labor in Greece and uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, social history of technology, uh, like uh, mines, uh, uh, women's and gender history. And uh, uh, she has uh, several publications, uh, uh, the latest of which I think is this uh, book. So Lisa, uh, you have the floor for listening. Uh, thank you, Marinos. Uh, thank you all for being here, for joining us uh, in this uh, book, uh, in this virtual book launch. Um, uh, I just want to say that uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the preparation of this uh, volume, of this Greek uh, Turkish volume on uh, labor history. Uh, it was uh, a very uh, nice experience of working with all these uh, colleagues, uh, historians from Turkey and Greece, and uh, especially with uh, Erdem uh, and all the colleagues. And uh, I want to, to, thank, uh, to thank them uh, for their patience and their collaboration. I want to thank personally um, the editor of the series of uh, International Studies in Social History uh, in Berkham Books, uh, Marcel van der Linden, for his uh, stable uh, support all these years, uh, for his stable support uh, in, uh, in our effort. And uh, now uh, I just, I, I will let uh, Erdem, uh, my friend and my colleague, uh, to, to tell the story uh, of this volume. Thank you all very much. Screen without any problems. And Marlena, thank you very much. So, this is was a really very eloquent uh, introduction. Thanks a lot. And also for other people who already presented the work, including Marinos and uh, Kerem. I'm a bit overwhelmed and very glad that we've got almost 80 uh, participants. Um, even this is a very good sign that we haven't spent uh, our effort and time for uh, uh, trivial subjects. So I'm very glad to see this. I hope uh, our work uh, will uh, meet uh, expectations, but I'm very glad that you are here. I'm looking forward to comments and discussions. So uh, great to have you here. Now, as just Lida has just mentioned, uh, very briefly, I would like you to give the story of the book a little bit, uh, because it is a context bounding as anything in academia and uh, in fact in life. So uh, let me start with uh, how we've started and how we've continued to work on this book and how we've completed it. And uh, first and foremost, uh, the point of departure uh, is in fact, uh, was a conference. And um, since we already announced this in the introduction, I do not need to shame myself any further. It is interesting, but the first seed has been planted 10 years ago. So it was a very lengthy process, mainly and mostly due to our inefficiencies. But uh, there are also advantages to work on a project like this, I think, for such a long time. I'll uh, mention them in a minute uh, very briefly. So we organized the conference. Um, at Bill University, where I used to teach, and in year 2011, in very close connection with some international organizations. So the point of departure was not a conference or an academic gathering for Ottoman studies uh, per se, but it was uh, trying to bring Ottoman labor history within a more international uh, context, and in fact, trying to connect the Ottoman historiography of labor, or uh, early Turkish Republic and labor history, with the global labor history. And therefore, we have invited a leader to this conference and other colleagues uh, from Greece. And that conference in 2011 was also academically and financially supported by the institutions listed uh, below. 
And from day one, it was an international um, attempt. Uh, and uh, we also had colleagues coming from India and Latin America and several other countries. So the aim back then in 2011 was to really try to bring, a, as I've said, uh, Ottoman historiography of labor uh, in a larger context of internationalization, but trying to bring it into also the theoretical perspective of global labor history. And there is a reason for that. And because we think we can also talk about the point of convergence or points of convergence between Lida and I, our work and our fields of study. And Amsterdam is important in this respect. And Lida has just mentioned uh, Marcel van der Linden is the editor of the series. But this institution was uh, quite influential for my academic um, agenda for quite a while. It is still very important for me, but especially uh, in the last 10 years, uh, I was trying to really get into active participation of the um, representatives of global labor history. And this in global labor history is uh, a major uh, agenda setting, setting act, major agenda setting, uh, let's say, aspect. Uh, within the large framework of European social science history conferences. So there is labor network there and labor network has been always a strong network there. And this, several of you have attended this conference. I remember uh, you being there. And in this conference series is started in 1996 as most of you know. And Lida and I, just I think by sheer uh, coincidence, we started to attend this conference in 2008, and uh, both Lida and I benefited a lot from getting into contacts, uh, getting into contacts with uh, international historians working on labor. So this was a really important um, watering hole, let's say, for me to internationalize what I was trying to do, and that's conducting modern labor history. And uh, from this institute. Uh, We've got also a more recent development. Uh, this is the European Labor History Network, established in 2013. And very recently, uh, Lida became the chair uh, of this network. So starting from 2008, uh, then the conference in 2011, and all in the last decade, both I and Lida uh, were very active in uh, the European Social Science History Conferences and also other institutions coming out of that, uh, trying to follow the trajectory of the global labor history, which has been spearheaded by Marcel van der Linde. Um, and since Marcel was also attending this conference in 2011, and probably some of you know this uh, gentleman who is now retired from his uh, position of the director of research um, at the International Institute of Social History, he has seen already, I mean, at the first coffee break, uh, I think after we presented our papers from Turkey and Greece, he has seen the potential within our conference that we can go for a publication. So during the conference, uh, Marcel van der Linde suggested me, hey, why don't you talk to Lida? I think you've got the material here. We can do something about that. So that was his uh, suggestion, to be honest, in 2011, that we should go for a publication. After we managed to mature the idea, he also invited us uh, to publish in the series that he's editing. Uh, and in this aspect, we were trying to follow, um, I personally, try to follow the advice uh, from late Donald Quattert uh, about uh, regionalization and internationalization of labor history. So both for the Turkish side as well as the Greek side of the aging. So, and from day one, I think in Leda, Leda and I, we were um, in almost complete understanding that we should internationalize and also regionalize our academic efforts in conducting labor history in this part of the world. So that was the beginning, uh, let's say. And then we started to work. And the Bergan series, uh, Marcel accepted the book idea and that was very welcoming for us. And this series is a series that I follow as a labor historian, also an economic and social historian. And in year 2015, we are the volume number 33 and in the series of international studies in social history. And that's the latest one uh, for the time being. I'm sure the series will continue. 
but uh, we that we are 33 and the latest um, work in the series and Suraya Faruqi and Suraya very nice to have you uh, thank you again so Suraya which has already published uh, another uh, volume uh, in the series and she started late but she has somehow managed to publish uh, five years earlier than us and that doesn't surprise me and if you know Suraya probably that doesn't surprise you either so we were late she was fast and she has published the book in 2015 but I'm very glad that she did that because now we have in the series uh, these two books one is uh, working uh, focusing more on the artisans and the craftspeople of the Ottoman Empire and covering it larger period and in our book we've got a more specific area to cover a shorter period of time and labor history and also trying to really contribute to the uh, global labor history effort and another very important reason for both Lida and I that we are happy to be in the series is Donald Quattert's uh, book uh, on Zongulak uh, minefield and uh, coal field uh, uh, sorry uh, and that was one of the earliest uh, volumes, uh, one of the earliest books uh, in the series, as you can see, way back in 2006. And that is that also shows Marcel's, let's say, perspective, insight, and also well-connectedness in the academic world. So now we've got these three books. Uh, if you just want to follow Turkish, Greek, Ottoman perspective, we've got these three volumes in, in the series. And we are very glad to be uh, there. There are other works uh, with eight volumes uh, in the series, which are also covering themes from Greek history. But specifically for the Ottoman, Turkish, and also Greek history, these three volumes are, I think, quite important. Uh, and they follow this track of international labor history. So then making of the book a little bit, uh, I would like two more minutes maybe, uh, don't want to take much time of that but um, since we worked on this for quite a long time it was a challenge but at the same time uh, really an enjoyable activity to invite people and convince them but since we were, we were very late then it was also a bit difficult to sustain them uh, so there were advantages and disadvantages mainly disadvantages i'll be honest so i wouldn't recommend you to work that long on a book project but there were some advantages for us as well. I mean, leaving aside the personal gain that we became better friends. Uh, the real advantage I think uh, for us uh, was that we tried to find matching contributions for the chosen topics. So we had the chance to ask our colleagues and friends after getting one work either from the Greek side or the Turkish side and think about, hey, can you write something like this? So that was a advantage. The price to pay was a bit high because it was too long to work on it, but I think it was an, it was an advantage for us. So the fact that we didn't just come together and brought the contributions together from a conference and publish it as they were presented, we had the chance to steer around subgroups within the book and i have the impression that it uh, increased i hope i hope i hope uh, that increases the readability and also it brought us a little bit closer to the aims we've set and i also would like to thank again marcel and to the series uh, an anonymous reviewer uh, informed marcel and marcel informed us that we should add two additional contributions they given if they've even given us the team and the era and the topic almost. So we've looked for that. So this was also another advantage that we worked hard on this. And lastly, for the making of the book, especially for the introduction and conclusion, I should just uh, mention that uh, I was in Athens um, in two long settings. And if anyone has done this before or planning to do this, coming together physically in the same place uh, have helped us enormously. That has helped us enormously. And here I would also like to thank uh, to the Spiros, uh, let us suppose, who's having a health problem who will, I hope he will overcome very quick. That was wonderful uh, to work in Athens. Uh, and this is quite important for me uh, to mention here. And um, one, uh, another special thanks uh, goes to Nikola Rankowski, 
who is uh, still a registered PhD student in our uh, department at uh, Koch University. He has out, he has helped us enormously, uh, especially uh, in the last stages of uh, preparing this uh, volume. We just have to mention his name here. And one note, uh, I can gladly announce that uh, Koch University Press uh, has already um, agreed with the translator, so they are working on the translation, and we are hoping to have the book uh, in Turkish available to the readers who want to read in Turkish, hopefully next year. And lastly, uh, I would like to thank, uh, sorry, not lastly, first the dedication. Uh, I have to mention this. This is not uh, this. This this is this is a quotation from the acknowledgments from the book, and I just wanted to put it here. Uh, that we are dedicating, we've dedicated this uh, volume to the memory of Leighton Kotter and Mangiliske Hriotis. And we miss them sorely. Uh, and we do think that they really uh, prepared uh, the ground uh, from which we uh, managed to bring scholarships, uh, scholarship together on both sides of the agents from the labor history perspective. And now, uh, lastly, I would very much like to thank the contributors. So we've just, edit we've just edited their work, the real heroes and the laborers uh, behind this book is in fact individual uh, contributors. And we cannot thank them enough, both for their work and as well as uh, for their uh, patience uh, in this lengthy process. Thank you very much. I will stop here and uh, thank you again for joining. Um, I'll pass the word back to Marinos. Yeah, thank you, Adam. And by the way, you didn't give me the chance to present you. <laughs> you uh, so uh, yes, this was Erdem Kabadai, Associate Professor of Economic History and History of Economic Thought in the Department of History of uh, Koch University. Uh, Adam had his uh, PhD from the University of Munich in 2008, and uh, he has extensively worked on the economic, financial, and labor history of the Ottoman Empire, and now uh, directing this uh, ERC project, uh, Urban Patients, uh, within the fields of digital and uh, geospatial humanities, uh, with a focus on the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. So now, if uh, I understand well that, that leader, you don't have to, you don't have anything more to say, so I'll pass directly to... No, no, it's uh, it's okay <laughs> for me. Okay. Erdem says uh, all the necessary things. Thank you. So I don't think I need to introduce uh, Suraga Faroki. Uh, it's impossible for every, anybody to, to be in the field of Ottoman history at large and not uh, be acquainted with her uh, work. Uh, uh, okay, for those that may not know it, uh, Soraya Faroti has, uh, well, she has been for, uh, for a long time at uh, Ludwig Maximilian's University in Munich uh, until her retirement in 2008. And then uh, she has uh, taught at uh, Istanbul Milgi University and uh, uh, now at uh, Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. Uh, she's a, a leading expert in Ottoman uh, social, economic, I would say also cultural uh, history. Uh, she's the author of uh, several books. I don't know. Uh, there must be more than 10 uh, or 15, perhaps. And, uh, uh, well, numerous uh, papers. Uh, so, okay. Uh, Suraya, you have the floor. And it's a very great joy to have, have you here. But you have to unmute yourself. Uh, so, Raja, you have to, to unmute. Yeah. Is it okay now? Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And now I'm going to try and screen share if I can, just a minute. Mm. Okay. Yeah. The screen share has worked, right? Uh, well, First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I mean, it's a great pleasure and a great honor. 
And I mean, uh, since I've only got about a little over 10 minutes, maybe, I cannot talk about all the papers individually, although I really would like to do that. Uh, however, I mean, when going through the volume, uh, what I thought all the time when reading is, well, I mean, people who work on the late 1800s and on the early 1900s, they really have one big advantage, namely that for all sorts of things for which we people who, you know, work on the 17th or 18th centuries, for which we don't have any documentation, we can ask the question, uh, we can maybe invent a couple of hypotheses, but really documentary proof is often elusive. And here, for instance, when I read uh, the, art, the uh, chapter by uh, Dr. Hans Arula, I was kind of green with envy because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of you know that uh, our colleague uh, Yahya yeah, uh, in Izmir uh, has, that he has worked on uh, Beslemes, and well, yours truly, Karunja Kararunja, as they say, uh, I also tried to chase down uh, young children who were, you know, given out uh, by their fathers to serve in strange households, because that is occasionally documented uh, for Ankara, even for the late 16th century. Well, and I mean, the older the documentation, the less detailed it is. And for instance, when reading Yahya Aras, uh, who has got some really fine pieces on the subject, he asks every now and then things like, well, when these young children, usually girls, were sent out to work for strangers, how did they feel about it? And, you know, what did, they, what did they think in such, when, you know, their mothers or their fathers told them, you know, now we are taking you to such and such a place and you will be a servant there. Well, when I read uh, Dr. Hans Arula's chapter, I realized that very often they said nothing. I mean, one of the people that Dr. Hans Arula quoted said, my parents told me nothing. I was just around the adults a lot and I listened. And from what I heard, I figured out that that was to be the project. And I mean, in such a situation, uh, the question of, you know, how these children felt in, in, you know, one of them even tells us, well, really, my feelings were irrelevant. I mean, uh, what she means is, uh, in Ottoman, you'd say, he's met a derma kulis in den olmala, because I am one of those who provides service. And, you know, I play that role. And how I feel about it is really immaterial. Now, I mean, I'm not saying, of course not, that this would have been the opinion of all young girls sent out for service. I'm sure, you know, some of them were maybe glad to be rid of a father who was often drunk or, the, or a mother who was constantly scolding, uh, you know, whatever. So maybe some of them were quite, quite pleased to go. And in other cases, maybe there was a lot of crying and pleading, who knows. But the point is that some of these issues are documented in Dr. Hans Arula's chapter. I mean, you, you have, uh, for instance, either she has questioned some of the more recent people herself, and otherwise, 
there is the Institute of Asia Minor Studies, and you know they have interviewed a lot of people who were maybe you know uh, servants in the 1920s, and who of course are not not alive anymore. Uh, but I mean, you would uh, in this case the questioning had already been done by the people who collected the information for the Asia Minor Institute. And they asked the questions that a 20th century researcher was curious about. And so therefore, I mean, I felt, oh my, this is, you know, this fills in a gap that, I mean, we can just not fill uh, when working on, you know, earlier or even, you know, late 18th century documentation like Yahya Araz is doing, or late 16th century documentation as, you know, I once tried to handle. Now, of course, you will say that the women uh, studied by Dr. Hansa Rula lived in a world that was different from, uh, you know, the world of the uh, Beslemes studied by Yahya Aras, and even, of course, even more different from the world of these uh, child servants that I found in Ankara Sijilat. But on, at the same time, yes, there is a distance, but at the same time, in some cases, it's a difference of two generations. And well, yes, I mean, the world changes very rapidly, a uh, difference of two generations uh, can be enormous. Uh, like, I mean, if I think of the difference of two generations, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother uh, died at age 32 uh, of the Spanish, probably of the Spanish flu. She was 32 years old uh, and she was already a widow and had probably already lost one child. Well, I mean, the world in which she lived in uh, Bitgosh uh, in Poland uh, could not have been more different from, you know, the, the world in which I have lived uh, over the past decades. But still, I mean, it's still to some extent uh, a common world, especially since quite a few of these young women came from Anatolia. I mean, from, I remember one case particularly vivid, it, it was about Manisa. Well, I mean, this is one case where you can, as an Ottoman social historian, you can connect uh, the, the uh, a study that deals with the late 19th and early 20th century with something that, uh, you know, is more, is at least to some extent connected with the, what people call the classical period. Now, there's another issue that really started me thinking, namely the two papers or chapters, uh, one by Nikos Potamianos and the other by Erol Ulker. Of course, the one by Erol Ulker is, you know, kind of especially close to home because he deals with the buildings that today are being are being used by Istanbul Bilgi University. So, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, power plant that he talks about is the power plant uh, that we walk by, you know, every morning when we come on campus. Uh, well, I mean, the point is that both, in both cases, we have exclusivist demands. I mean, at first I was really puzzled when I, I read the title national preference demand. I just thought, what, what exactly does that mean? But then when I read the, uh, in the chapter, it became very clear, namely that these people wanted to see colleagues in their workplace that were close to them from the same town, from the same village, from the same religion, uh, from the same nationality. And I mean, as Errol Ulker, you know, put it, well, refugees, foreigners, non-Muslims, 
I mean, even the non-Muslims, even if they're Turkish citizens, for in the eyes of the uh, workers who belong to the majority population, uh, they are all somehow foreigners and somehow they're not really wanted. Well, I mean, at first, of course, you say, hmm, how strange, because we all expect trade unions uh, to be a little more internationalist in outlook. But then I started to think, well, I mean, what has Genghis Kodlu said about uh, serial migration? Namely, I mean, uh, Genghis has uh, mostly worked on the late 18th and the early 19th centuries. And well, at one point, uh, yours truly, uh, I was concerned with migration into Egypt, uh, more like in the middle of the 18th century. And what we get all the time is serial migration, meaning that people come from the same place to do a very particular kind of job. And at some point, the older generation retires to the Memleket and new people from the same area take their places. And I mean, Genghis Kudla found that sometimes the Hemsheikh Rilik, uh, being from the same village, was so important that they were even willing to bridge the Muslim non-Muslim gap. That is, I mean, it was important to have a Mamlekatli. And if, you know, you might find a Muslim perfectly willing to accept a Christian if he was a Mamlekatli and the other way around. Well, I mean, that is, as I said, familiar. It's a part of serial migration. But then, I mean, if you know that that was happening, then uh, you start, of course, thinking about the analogy to the national preference demands. And you may say, okay, the, uh, you know, these uh, people who migrate into Istanbul in the 18th and 19th centuries, they are artisans, they're not workers. True. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, if you think of trade unions in very many countries, very many societies, the, the earliest trade unionists are people with an artisan background. I mean, that's true of England, uh, that's true of Germany in the mid 19th century. I mean, I'm sure you can find any number of examples the world over. So therefore, if that is part of the tradition of you know, what you might call serial migration, the, the bakers who come from a certain town in central Greece, to be bakers in Istanbul uh, or in Europe, there was such a case. Or, and you know, there are many such examples. Well, I mean, if artisan migration was kind of the, you know, beginnings, the beginning of working class migration, then maybe it's not so strange that art certain artisans insisted uh, on having only people from their hometown and that in the labor movement, to a certain extent, uh, this tradition continued. And of course, I mean, uh, labor internationalism uh, was really something that took a lot out of the people who tried to inculcate it in their neighbors. I mean, it was really not something that was easily explained to people who were very much tied to their hometowns, to their home villages, to their local communities. And therefore, uh, I mean, felt that they wanted to see these people in the workplace and no one else. Well, and then, I mean, as I could see that my time is running out, but there's one issue that I just do need to say something about for at least three or four minutes. And that is the graph that Alpijaikaya 
has included in his paper, I think it's on page 65, uh, if you care to look at it. And it is not about uh, serfs and non serf and non-serf peasants. It's about historiography. And I mean, he has kind of, in his table, he has drawn a genealogy of, you know, people who's of the, the work that has been done on uh, peasants tied to the soil and tied to the soil by chiefly owners. And I mean, his, uh, the area on which he works is especially Turhala or Trikala. And I mean, I, uh, I think that this uh, table is absolutely great. I mean, when I saw it, uh, I started to grin and I'm still grinning, uh, but it's something that also you do want to talk about when you look at the section where he, he put Fikret Adonur and our dear departed friend Jill Weinstein and uh, yours truly in one part, uh, namely people who talk about mobile peasants. Okay, fine, fair enough. However, I think what you do need to say in all of this is that we are talking about different regions. And I think, you know, it's really a problem when we uh, forget that the Ottoman Empire was a very vast territory which had any number of regional cultures. And yes, I mean, if you work principally on Anatolia, then uh, peasants do get to be mobile because they run away during the Jalali uprisings. They run away from the droughts. And I mean, Semih Chilik with his, you know, no work in this country of misery, he has worked on droughts. Uh, so, I mean, if you are basically a person who has collected his or her evidence on Anatolia, then of course you think of peasants who are mobile because if they didn't run, if they hadn't run away, uh, they would have died of hunger. I mean, uh, given the horrible droughts that they had uh, around 1600, and then again uh, in the 1840s, and again in 1870. And therefore, I mean, if you look at the work of Dan Goffman on Izmir, uh, and he shows, I mean, that people came from Anatolia into the Izmir area simply because they hope for work. And then when you look at uh, the work of people like Sam White, then you can see that yes, in the Izmir area, rain was more or less reliable. And therefore, I mean, people ran away from the Ankara area. I remember that at one point, I looked at an 18th century document concerning the area to the west of Ankara. It's called Haimana, but uh, that's not important. And it was somebody had compared the list of villages from the 16th century with what he saw in the 18th century. And what it said was Hali Beharap, Hali Beharap, meaning, you know, empty and devastated. Well, I mean, so therefore, Obviously, these people have run away. And if you, you know, if you look at uh, the work on uh, by Oktay Özel on Amasya, well, then too, I mean, Amasya lost population, and some of these people doubtless died, but some of them again must have run away. So therefore, I mean, my time is up. Uh, I need to conclude. Uh, but as you can see, I mean. Uh, this is a great work. And I mean, uh, it's something that gets a person who has to deal with a much more incomplete documentation. It's some, you know, it's something that starts you thinking. And I, I think that that is the great merit of this volume. 
And I mean, my congratulations to the editors, my congratulations to the contributors, uh, and I apologize in advance that I haven't been able to mention all the contributors, uh, but I think I would have gotten chased off the screen ignominiously, and I would have had to run all the way to Izmir uh, because of, you know, uh, being persona non grata here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Suraya. Uh, so we pass now to our next uh, uh, expert in the panel, uh, who is uh, Professor Sokratis Tepezas. Uh, uh, Sokratis is also a, a collaborating member of the Institute of the Mediterranean Studies, uh, but uh, he's a, mainly a professor in the Department of History and Archaeology of uh, the University of Crete. Uh, he is president of the Greek Economic History Association. Uh, he has studied uh, economics in Thessaloniki and uh, history in Paris. Uh, He's been teaching in uh, Crete uh, since uh, 1990, and he's uh, the author of many books, especially on economic and uh, rural uh, history of uh, the Greek land, but also uh, global history. So uh, I give the floor to Socrates. Uh, for his Thank comments. you. Thank you for having me with you. I'm really honored to talk after Suraya. And let me say that I feel that this is a, a very important book because, well, of course, it's bridging the Aegean somewhere it's written. And this is true. And it's an econ a book on economic and labor history that brings together Turkish and Greek historians. And under the, the global uh, labor history paradigm. And this, I think it's particularly welcome because I, I, at least from the Greek side, we have something of, a, let's say, of a lack of, uh, of being in, uh, in phase with international uh, uh, developments in, in, in economic history. But I think it's even more important than that in the sense that it's, it's the result of a voluntarist approach. It's not something normal or something that used to be, to be done easily 20 years ago. I think we must celebrate the fact that we finally have uh, Greek and Turkish historians the younger generation, of course, working together on common ground and on shared research interests. And this is a long way beyond what I used to, to experience 30 or 40 years ago. So this is really an, a, a collective academic achievement. And I'm not sure that the, the younger historians generation uh, really understands it, but it's really a different landscape from what I have known 40 years ago when well, I was a graduate student. And I want to emphasize that. And I would be very glad if we could go beyond bridging the Aegean. I mean, it's very good to bridge the Aegean to bring Greeks and Turkish historians together. But I think that we should think beyond that to, to understand the common geographic space that we work on. And, um, and of course, in, in the introduction, I think by Erdem and Lida, somewhere it is said that the Turkish historians take for granted that they can monopolize the legacy of the Ottoman Empire, somehow the Ottoman legacy. And it is true that on the other side, Balkan historians try to keep the Ottoman legacy as something as a dirty secret of the family. And I think we must go beyond that. And we must, we must think in, in, the, in the way Nikolai Yorga thought when he proposed Byzance après Byzance, Byzantium after Byzantium, that is the Eastern Roman Empire after the Eastern Roman Empire. I think we, we must take it for granted that we have 
a common geographical space and the successors start, uh, states and societies of the Ottoman Empire. I think we can, we must confront the fact that we are living in a post-Ottoman societies and states and take it seriously into consideration. And think of the larger space of Eastern Mediterranean, the Black Sea and the Red Sea as a space where economic and social developments evolved that touched all those societies and bringing them together. I think this is a book that's, that's going on this, on this direction and I'm glad to see it. I just want to go beyond just bridging the idea and let's say seeing the, 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 the Eastern Mediterranean, Black Sea, Red Sea space as a common area where networks, societies are, are, are meeting each other. Well, this is a, and a very novel book from another point of view, I think. When I, was, when I was thinking of labor history, I'm not a labor historian. I'm not here as an expert. I'm rather here as, an, as a guy from an older generation. And, but when I, th when I was thinking about labor history, uh, I wouldn't expect a book like that 20 years ago. I thought that there was a lack of relevant sources. This book goes well beyond that. I would think that the supposedly retarded capital development, capitalist development in the Eastern Mediterranean would not have a large number of permanent male wage earners. So there wouldn't be too much of a labor, of a wage labor to discuss about. And of course, having an, ob an obsessive interest on political and militant history of labor parties, trade unions, this would be some, you know, a, a, a sore spectacle if we put it to vis-a-vis uh, -vis the German labor movement of the British trade unions. So labor history 20 years ago, 25 years ago, as ago looked something very pale, very, uh, you know, something that wasn't that important. And I think this book really shows that we can easily go beyond this kind of, of old way of thinking. But to do that, we must, of course, go beyond the way we did labor history 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, we must somehow go beyond the, 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 the male wage earner labor relations and think of multiple forms of labor control, labor discipline, labor mobilization, subjugation. It's not only free labor. And uh, I'm very glad to see that it really, it, it isn't something that happened just in the 16th or the 19th century something that really happens in the 20th century. There are many points in the books that you can see that. And of course we can see the multiple forms of resistance. And let me say here that if something is missing in this book is let's say a larger part on, the res on, on, on labor resistance. There's a lot, of, the, we discuss it, you discuss it, but one would expect something more of course, it's, it's much more difficult to see it, granted. And we, we can't do all things together. But I think this is, a, this is a very interesting book. And of course, being a, a rural historian who is fond of numbers, I can't say how envious I am for the use of 1844 Temetua tax income registers. I remember reading a book by the figurant 40 years ago, it was a book published in Sofia in 1982 on a, on a small Bulgarian Ahie. I didn't really expect at that moment that one would really, really use it in such a scale. Yeah. Which so was how far, how, how rich our common quantitative legacy is. I mean, you have the, 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 the impression that quantitative economic, economic history is impossible in our case. It's not, it's not really the fact. I mean, you, you can do that. And 
I think that the paper by by uh, Demka Badiuc, of course, a part of his ERC project, and Murat Juvench is very interesting. I would just well, one thing that really not bothered me, but I was wondering, can we really compare the Armenians or the Jews, and even more the Roma, uh, with the Christians and the Muslims when we work on ethnic division of labor? Such small communities in each city as the Armenians or the Jews or the, 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 the Roma, they are by definition destined to coagulate in certain uh, in certain networks, in certain uh, occupations. I was thinking, for instance, that if my understanding was correct 35 years ago, I would say that Armenians would be close to the networks of, uh, of cotton cloth trade and, and finishing in the Ottoman Empire. So they would be somehow, they would have a, a path dependency on being engaged in this kind of occupation. So saying that the, 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 the Armenians in clothing or the Jews in itinerant small trade were ethnically, have an ethnic division of labor, would just say that if you have a, a small enough population, you would certainly have an ethnic division of labor somehow, which is very much if we had the, the possibility to follow, for instance, Fatma Angel's uh, population of, uh, of Bulgarian, Christian Bulgarian uh, Abaji in Istanbul or wherever. They were actually Memletkeji, as Suraya was saying. They were actually groups of artisans with close origins in some kind of, of guild of corporation that were linking the, 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 the place of, uh, uh, of finishing Istanbul, for instance, with the original place of, uh, of, uh, of waving. So I think you have an excellent source, but it's, it's, it's too difficult to just compare Christians with a small Armenian or Jewish community. But I'm sure you're going you are going to go beyond that. And uh, having worked on proto-industrialization, I must say, and I think Svetla Yaneva, who is with us, would agree with me that the paper by Fatima Angel is fascinating. Thank you very much, Fatima. Really, I mean, I would love to have this kind of documentation 30 years ago. And, but it's, it's an excellent paper. And uh, all papers, I think, are, are of very, very high quality. And they, they are just, I mean, you, you, you can't really understand how far our perception has changed. When we see the, the papers by uh, Akin Shefer, Shinan Shinger, Erol Ulker, Epotamianos, you get to understand that somehow what we were thinking 30 years ago, the international labor movement, people who have a class consciousness, and that's the prime thing. And then exclusive exclusion was something of an exception. It's the other way around, really. I mean, the, 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 the important thing is how, how difficult it was for these people to go beyond their understanding of excluding others in order to monopolize a small segment. And it took a lot of political intellectual work to go beyond the nationalist or the, um, the exclusivist like a G approach to something of a political trade, internationalist trade unionist approach. And we should not think that this happened as well. And this is something maybe that you could have included in this, in this book. Although it's a little bit vieux jeu, uh, somehow I was at the end of, of reading the book I said of course this is it uh, identities uh, gendered identities 
um, ethnic identities, cultural identities are more important. Exclusion is the major way that you protect your 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 your, your little your little uh, privilege. But well, there's not there's there was another world, and there was another way, and I think this should also be brought in this this approach, and it can easily be done, I'm sure. So uh, I think it's a, from that point of view, this is a very renovating uh, renovating book because it changes our comprehension. Uh, if there is something also missing, I would say. There is a lot about gendered identities. Right now in France, racialized identities are in fashion. And there is nothing on race in the Ottoman Empire. And at least in Crete, there were a small community of uh, uh, of, uh, um, of liberated black slaves. And they are not there, I think, that one should also bring it in in order not to, 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 to give the impression that it was never, never a question. I think that Toledano has done its great work, but I think we, we must bring it in from the point of view of labor history. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, those are really small criticism in order to just has somehow legitimize my presence here. And um, another thing I would like to, to, to discuss is somehow why, I mean, uh, Arkujelska, yeah, excellent paper, and knowing his work, I, I know that this is part of a larger, a larger universe made me think that there is also, this is a book about, about somehow liminal experiences, liminalities. Uh, and I think that when you have presented various identities of labor, various forms of labor, corvée labor, wage labor, sharecropping labor, but I think free and dependent labor. But I think there is also a question about those who are liminal between being free laborers, laborers without a property in the Marxian sense, and those who have something of a property, a small piece of land, but who are actually surviving thanks to supplementary labor and who are somehow in between in a hybrid state between a laborer and the proprietor or not proprietor somebody with a secure lifelong uh, right of use of usufruct of a tasharu for instance on a piece of land but at the same time he is seasonally, temporarily, in his life cycle, laboring. And I think this is, if I, maybe I miss it, but I, I didn't see it really. Uh, Arbugel or the Haji Yosif in their papers talked a little bit because they were talking about rural, rural societies, but they didn't really confront it face to face, I mean, in a, in a frontal way. And I think that in those societies, there was also a liminal position between being a laborer, living from his labor, and having a kind of property, being a, an owner of something, living partly from that, but also from labor. A large part of, uh, of Atma's uh, angel, uh, uh, proto-industrial workers were partly small owners. And they have, as in Greece, minuscule properties. But they deeply felt, the, they, they, they deeply perceived themselves as being, let's say, in a position of owner. And I think this 
should maybe be brought in in a later stage probably. So I hope I have not make a fool of my expertise. And thank you very much for, for this book. Uh, now I must try to, to think in another way as well. I mean, I was thinking about the, the, the Federation of Salonica, the, the Jewish, not Jewish, but uh, Federation Albrer of Salonica. We used to have two histories, two separate histories. La Federation, after the, the, the the annexation of Salonica to the Greek state, and the, the same the same organization, its history before during the Ottoman time, and of course, this is just the, the history of a trade union and the political organization, and this seems to be some somehow parochial, which is not. And I, I hope in the next future you are going to have another larger volume, much more interesting and. And congratulations, thank you very much for the opportunity to read those papers. Thank you, Socrates. Uh, okay, if we have time for discussion, it promise to be quite uh, interesting. So I'll, to save time, I'll give the floor directly to John Najjar, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at uh, Koch University. Uh, so John has uh, completed his uh, PhD in uh, Binghamton University with uh, Donald Quarter in 2010, and he specializes in uh, Ehrman history, labor history of uh, the late uh, Ottoman Empire. So uh, John, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to take the floor after all these distinguished professors, although it was just probably a luck for me because I had a class to teach. Uh, so Erdem kindly puts me at the very end of the list. Uh, so, and it's uh, very nice to see uh, this uh, crowd to listen the uh, contributions and to see some of the friends, uh, Erol, Akun and all the other people. And uh, probably first of all, I should underline that as a student of history, uh, specifically Ottoman labor history, it was a great pleasure for me to read each and every one, uh, every piece uh, of this volume, pursuing to challenge the task of, uh, pursuing the challenging task of connecting the histories, uh, specifically the labor histories of Greece and Turkey by going beyond the nationalist historiographic approach. So, as uh, both the editors underlined, this is a very challenging task. And uh, reading all these articles, uh, starting with the historiographic essay, it was a great pleasure to follow uh, the debates that the scholars involved in. And I personally think that this volume uh, has made a number of important contributions to the field of labor history. And in what follows, I will try to briefly, in fact, very briefly, uh, to discuss uh, three of them. And like Sureya Aja, unfortunately, I won't be able to uh, refer all the pieces. Uh, but overall, I can say that all of them are uh, very good in terms of their debate sources and methodologies. And while talking about the contributions, maybe first of all, I should say that as editors have underlined in their historiographic introduction, since the late 20th century, a number of new themes, such as gender and women's labor history, agricultural labor relations, and non-unionized non forms of resistance have been incorporated into the Ottoman, Greek, and Turkish labor history. And I think research articles in this volume contributes to this thematic expansion in varying degrees. To give just one example, Semih Celik in his piece titled, No Work for Anyone in the Country of Misery, draws our attention to the disconnect between labor and environmental history of the Ottoman Empire. In an effort to uh, overcome this disconnect, Celik focuses his attention on a devastating famine that struck Anatolia 
from 1845 to 48 and examines first how Ottoman people, especially those in rural areas, responded to this social ecological crisis. Second, how their responses affected labor relations in both urban and rural areas. And third, how all this led to a re-evaluation re of the relationship between nature and labor by the Ottoman people. Like I'm eagerly hoping that such studies, such contributions would in the near future would facilitate further collaboration between environmental and labor historians working on the Ottoman Empire and its successor states, specifically here in that case, Greece and Turkey. In terms of contributions, I think secondly, I should underline that several of the pieces in the volume revisited some old questions and debates, such as proto-industrialization and ethno-religious division of labor in the Ottoman Empire by utilizing novel questions, resources, sources, and methodologies. For example, by drawing on Ottoman tax registers, Temet Tuats from the mid 19th century, Fatma Öncel in her piece titled Rural Manufacturing in the mid 19th century Ottoman countryside, first of all demonstrate that the residents of the three villages in Plovdi earned their living primarily on manufacturing, textile manufacturing, and then discusses in detail the factors that made this situation possible in rural Bulgaria. And in doing this, I think Angel very successfully challenged the conventional perception that sees industrial production only as side employment in Ottoman countryside. In their article coming right after Angel's, Erdem Kabadayi and Murat Güvenç also uses the Temetuat registers as their main source and revisit another old but still unsettled debate on ethno-religious division of labor in Ottoman lands. Extracting data for more than 50,000 observations from 16 urban locations in Anatolia and the Balkans, Kabadayı and Güvenç concludes that there was no strict ethnic division of labor in agriculture, manufacturing and service sectors of the Ottoman economy. Yet, they continue, there were significant concentrations of occupation, occupations along the lines of ethno-religious belonging in a few subsectoral groups. I think in addition to making a valuable contribution to an unsettled debate, piece by Kabadayi and Güvenç clearly shows how certain primary sources here in the specific case, Temet registers, could be effectively used, utilized to undertake comparative work. And in enlisting the contributions, last but definitely not the least, I think I should highlight that this volume draws our attention to the shared experiences of capitalist and working classes in Greece and Turkey in the post-Ottoman period. For instance, although the articles by Lida Papa Stefanaki and Barış Alpözden do not enter in a direct dialogue with each other, they draw, uh, as I said, our attention to a number of important commonalities between or among these societies. First of all, for instance, they show that scientific management approach such as Taylorism grow in popularity in both countries during the interwar period. And second, they underline that capital, capitalist entrepreneurs, specifically textile factory owners and their managers use very similar tactics in both countries to exert their authority and ensure the loyalty and submission of their workers. After reading the articles by both authors, it seems to me that it is apparently or obviously not a coincidence that after encountering a wave of labor unrest, the Greek and Turkish entrepreneurs in Hermopolis and Istanbul engaged heavily in paternalistic practices and sought to construct an image of benevolent fathers watching over their workers. At the very end of their insightful historiographical essay, the editors write that 
This volume code should be seen as an effort to prepare the ground for future comparative work. And I think that thanks to such contributions by Barish, Lida, and in fact, the historiographical essay itself, this effort proved certainly successful. And before finishing this short talk, I would like to thank the editors and each of the contributors for bringing into existence this volume, which as both Erdem and Lida hope, facilitate an expansion and deepening of the Ottoman, Greek and Turkish labor history. Thanks a lot and good evening to you all. Thank you, uh, John. So now we have completed this uh, first cycle of uh, comments. And uh, I must say there were uh, some very uh, interesting points uh, uh, raised. Uh, so it's half past seven. I think we can talk for about half an hour at least without uh, exhausting uh, our audience. Uh, so I, I would propose first, I mean, if there is uh, a, a reaction from the editors perhaps, so from them or uh, Lida, uh, and secondly, from uh, if there is a kind of uh, response for, from the panel to, to comments or points raised, we could uh, begin uh, with uh, this and then uh, you could all uh, uh, raise hands uh, through the Zoom, uh, uh, through the reactions uh, button, uh, or also send a question to the chat, so I could uh, see it and have a short or shorter or longer discussion. Yeah, and then. Uh, I will not respond to wonderful points raised by uh, several uh, people, especially from Tropates. So I will not respond to the individual paper. Thank you very much. If there will be time remaining there, uh, we can get back to it. I don't want to steal time from other people. Uh, but, uh, this is was really um, still eye-opening, and it just showed me that the book is just started to live. So it is not a project, it's the end of the project, but I think that will be a um, reception of the book and that's wonderful. Uh, I just want to highlight the fact that um, Lida and I uh, think that we, thanks to the contributors' efforts, um, hopefully put a mark in, let's say, for the historiography of uh, late 2010s. So if the readers can see today and in the coming years to, uh, let's say, um, a positioning of the historiography and uh, is an aim setting, we would be very happy. So I just want to say this. I just want to say that I will not react to individual comments for this in the first round, but I'm very glad to have all those comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Lida. Yes. Uh... Thanks. Uh, thank you all for uh, these um, important uh, comments. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to hear uh, Suraya and uh, Socrates and uh, Chan uh, Nakar. Um, there are open uh, routes, uh, of course, for comparisons and connections, and uh, we tried to to do. Uh, some uh, comparisons uh, and connections, uh, but uh, we have uh, still uh, many uh, roads, many approaches to, uh, to walk and to elaborate. And uh, I think this is a collective um, effort uh, a collective academic effort. And uh, for me, this is, uh, it is very important, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, collective effort. I heard with uh, a lot, with much of interest, uh, uh, the, uh, the criticism, uh, especially from, uh, 
from Socrates, uh, I, I missed a little bit. Uh, I disconnect for a while when uh, Suraya talked, but uh, I heard with uh, with much of interest the criticism raised by Socrates, and uh, I thank him personally for also for his comments. And I think we can go on also uh, with uh, some uh, more elaborations about uh, qu questions about uh, uh, slave labor or unfree labor uh, in uh, in the Ottoman Empire and in uh, uh, both in the Greek lands and in uh, in the Turkish lands and uh, I think uh, it's a question that all already Christos Hadziosif has uh, a wake uh, a wake up uh, in the okay, it seems yeah. Lida has a connection problem. Uh, Lisa, can you hear us? Uh, she's probably left because the number of participants uh, oh, sorry, yeah. she will be back, I think. Okay, she she mentioned uh, having connection problems just before. Uh, so let's just wait. Um, meanwhile, uh, I don't see any hands raised. Ah, okay. So we have a comment or question from uh, Verbi by, by San. Um, yeah, th thank you. I mean, thanks for all participants. I will keep my video um, off for um, connection reasons. But whether your project um, at all involves uh, child labor, both in, in the Ottoman Empire, if you say, Istanbul and the Greek side. Is there anything on that in 1920s, 30s, especially? Mm -hmm. I think my Unfortunately, Lida is not here. Therefore, yes, there are. I mean, there is, first of all, um, like Surya Farouk has also mentioned in the work of Lida, we've got uh, domestic workers. So, and uh, these are, um, it's difficult to define what a child is, but these are non-adults. So we've got non-adults working in domestic uh, settings. So we've got the child labor there. And also Dr. Hansa Zurula's work is on uh, domestic labor. And so Lida is back. Uh, she can add additional uh, things there. But uh, it's difficult to define what a child is for even for the late 19th century. Uh, but I think we can say that we've got non-adult dependent labor uh, covered um, by uh, some uh, contributions. That would be my short response. Thanks for the question. Lisa, welcome back. Yes, uh, I have some uh, problems or in connection to today. Uh, I, it's, Sorry for this. Uh, anyway, uh, I just uh, want to say that uh, I think that there are uh, many uh, uh, hopes uh, uh, to, to do things together and to elaborate uh, in uh, labor history and in social history uh, uh, the common uh, the common uh, past, our shared common past. So uh, thank you for the comments and Again. Okay, I was about to, to, to say about the question on child labor, but okay, unfortunately, uh, maybe Pothitikhan Zarula, I see Maria Papathanasi is with us, I think so. Maybe Pothitik could, could reply to the question on, on child labor, etc. From the Greek point of view. Yes. Uh, Thank you. My 
uh, connection was, I was all the time in and out uh, because in the Mitilini that I am, uh, it seems that uh, uh, there is a problem. Um, yes, uh, I didn't uh, quite, I mean, uh, I, I understood that it's not a specific question um, on child labor, uh, if I understood well, but uh, um, in uh, the framework of my work on uh, domestic uh, workers uh, in the uh, beginning, in the first half of the 20th century, um, and uh, Soraya Farocchi also referred to uh, this uh, equivalence uh, uh, between uh, Beslem and, and, uh, um, and children uh, in, uh, in domestic work that did not receive uh, a salary. And uh, they worked uh, um, in a kind of a fictive, uh, in the framework of a fictive uh, um, uh, family uh, uh, bond uh, as uh, domestic workers, uh, an institution that was uh, also present uh, since uh, medieval time, we can say, uh, in Italy. Um, it was called uh, Per l'amore del Dio, uh, for the love of God and in Greece, uh, Psychochores. Uh, uh, and uh, the interesting thing uh, is that uh, they perceived themselves uh, as workers and not as family members. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was uh, one of the findings of uh, oral uh, history and uh, the fact that it enables oral testimonies and enable me to uh, work on uh, emotions and, uh, and see that how emotions, children's emotions contributed uh, to uh, their uh, subordination in the household but also to the construction of their identities later uh, in life uh, as uh, workers. Yet, uh, what I mean by emotions, mainly shame about doing this work. There is a stigma in Greece about uh, domestic uh, labor, and this uh, made them uh, conceal their identities. So it is a case about uh, identity, not about uh, identity, but more about concealing identity or uh, denying one's identity uh, as a domestic worker. At the same time, uh, resisting this family discourse on uh, children as uh, family members and not workers from the point of view of the middle class. Uh, I don't want to uh, talk more about uh, that because there are other contributions, other maybe questions. I think Soraya has also uh, raised his Yeah, hand. I just have, uh, I mean, some uh, one or two comments uh, for this, you know, absolutely fascinating paper uh, that Dr. Hans Arula has uh, contributed. Namely, when you look at the work of Yahya Aras, it turns out that in the 19th century, we get a move from Tebena, which is adoption, to 
people who work uh, under a contract. And by the late 19th century, the contracts say very clearly how much the, the child should be paid, how much should be spent on her subsistence, and how much she should receive at the time of leaving. And then there may be supplementary gifts, but we even get a tendency to have the supplementary gifts regulated by the contract, which means that this is Istanbul. Uh, and what's more, all these contracts tend to come together in one particular court, namely Dawud Basha. And it seems that you get specialized of, uh, you know, scribes and officials who help people set up these contracts, which means so there's a clear transition from adopted child with without a contract and the pay unclear and free time unclear. And then towards the end of the century, around 1900, when these matters are mostly uh, established by contract. And in addition, you get a clear difference between children for whom the father makes a contract and then young girls who are, you know, past puberty. Well, in the 19th century in Istanbul, marriage gets to be later than it used to be. And by the late 19th century, uh, the average age at first marriage is 19. And in the early 20th century, it's 20, which means that there is a period of six, seven, eight years in which uh, these girls are adults, can make their own contract. And at the same time, they're not yet married. Uh, so you get you know, these, these young women shopping around for a good country, you know, for a place where, you know, the other people say that it's a good place in which to work, and then they will apply. Uh, so from being, uh, you know, child servants, uh, kind of pseudo members of the family, uh, they become much more clearly, you know, people who work and it's work like any other work and it's regulated by contract. And I was really surprised when I read your article, I thought, oh, well, uh, your cases are later because, I mean, Yahya Arraz's book ends around 1920 and your cases for the most part are later. And yet what you describe can kind of look like the cases in Istanbul that were on record, let's say, in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so it seems that uh, Istanbul was often special in many ways, and that the passage toward contractual regulations that Yahya Aras found in Istanbul, that this was apparently a peculiarity of Istanbul. And it didn't happen any place else. At least that's uh, the conclusion I drew from your article. Would you agree with that? When we talk about child labor, uh, uh, because uh, in uh, Greece there was this. Uh, uh, the law since uh, 1912 uh, that uh, child labor was uh, forbidden in other types of uh, labor after having signed the um, Washington uh, uh, Treaty in 1921 also. Uh, but um, uh, there was a big resistance to uh, implement this uh, law on uh, uh, abolishing child labor in domestic uh, service uh, until the 1980s. Uh, so although 
children could work in uh, uh, domestic service uh, by law. Uh, it was uh, uh, under uh, mainly the civil law there, uh, the agreement between uh, the, the two parties, employer and employee. And, uh, and not under labor legislation. And so we did not uh, have, uh, th there was the possibility of having a contract for a certain amount of money at the end of service, which was set in a, in a, in a certain amount of time, let's say it could be five years, 10 years, uh, but this uh, did not usually happen. And uh, parents arranged uh, the payment uh, and they, they put this money or give, gave the money directly to parents uh, with ha without usually having an official uh, contract. And nevertheless, this, this contract said that if children left service earlier, then they wouldn't uh, get uh, money. They wouldn't get uh, remuneration for their work. So this was uh, about children, but for um, uh, young uh, uh, girls, uh, there was this uh, arrangement, but not with an official contract uh, of uh, having a, a salary and not under uh, labor legislation. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, well, sure. Thank you very much. I mean, it's fascinating because, I mean, you, uh, Yahya Araz's work and your work, uh, they are kind of connected. And I mean, I have, for me, I, I am trying to do something on more general on Ottoman women. And I was, you know, absolutely fascinated by your article because it kind of filled in some of it, it answered some of the questions that Aras asked himself or that he asked his readers and that the readers asked themselves. And well, I mean, you are talking about situations that are somewhat later, but not that much later. And therefore, I mean, what you say is extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Lida is back again. Uh, so, uh, I see uh, Erdem has also raised his hand. I am, I already talked too, too much, but therefore if there will be any other uh, contributions, I don't want to steal time, but I also don't want that uh, Socrates, several points of him that raised regarding the book uh, shouldn't be left there on their own. Um, if it's okay, I just want to respond to that, Marinos, if it's possible. I haven't seen any other uh, hands up, therefore I'm taking this. Socrates, uh, Socrates, thank you. And uh, two, I mean, I just want to highlight three things from your uh, notes as the editors of one of the editors of this book. First, this um, slavery race thing that you suggest. Um, I fully agree. Uh, so we've been discussing this also with Lida earlier. And I, this is, in fact, from my point of view, I think I didn't miss a major work in the uh, historiography on the Turkish and Ottoman aspects of the things, but slavery has been worked uh, on uh, surely, and Surya Oje is here, and we know the works there. There's a very recent latest edition of contribution from Hülya Canbakal and um, Alpay Filiz uh, Tekin on slavery in Bursa from a labor perspective. But I also do think that um, they work on Bursa mainly starting from the 16th century and they go through Terekid registers for the later centuries. But for the, I mean, 
let's contextualize the remark that you just did. So for this book or for later studies, I think it's better to think about the for later studies, fertile grounds. So thank you very much for the suggestions of those fertile grounds. I think one of that is really on free labor. And uh, either it can be Angaria, uh, so corvée, or, or slavery, or other forms of unfree labor, and can be, I think, studied connectedly and comparatively in going beyond the bridging the agent. And I do think that there is really a promising land there for uh, new research. And Alpujal Kayas and uh, Christopher Joseph's uh, works are, I think, just the beginning. But uh, that is definitely uh, something I think we should keep in mind and try to pursue. And it is kind of also connected to the other mark that you made um, regarding what I will call by employment, this the property relationship of the workers. I think those two aspects can be really interesting places to look deeper and try to really examine in, in, in future studies. I just, this is my take from your uh, remarks and I just want to put them there. And very lastly, so these two fields, let's say I'm free labor from my, for in, in my formulation, race, slavery, Angaria, Corvée, or this by employment, which means interconnectedness of agricultural production with um, working lives. I think, especially for this, I'm quoting from you, common geographic space, especially in this part of the world, uh, should be on agenda for future comparative work. Uh, because of the importance of agro-industries, agricultural dynamics, or maybe maritime dynamics. So the fact that in this part, uh, the physical geography and the fact that those physical geography sets the, let's say, agenda for agricultural production and also industrial connections to agricultural production, I think very good signs, I think, that we should keep those fields, we should prioritize those fields for future collaborative, comparative, connected work. I just want to thank you for uh, those remarks. That was it. Thanks again. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other uh, answer. It's getting very near uh, eight o'clock, so okay, I think uh, I know Lida would like to, to say something because she wrote to me, but uh, now uh, if there's no more uh, comment, I mean, and we have to, to end this uh, discussion, uh, I could say uh, just like Lida, uh, this is a book to be read. This is a book to be to be used, and uh, the, 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 I mean, I think that all of us, all, all of you who may have not yet uh, read or uh, studied thoroughly this uh, this book, uh, have your uh, uh, curiosity and interest uh, raised by this. And these presentations and the uh, discussion and the points uh, raised. Uh, so, uh, if I, Lina, do you want to, to, to talk before I finish it? No? Okay, so. Uh, Every time that I took uh, the speech, I, I, I disconnect. <laughs> so, it's not a good idea to, 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 to talk again. But uh, uh, yes, uh, there is a suggestion to read and use the book. And uh, this is the way that uh, we can uh, collaborate more and uh, connect our shared past uh, more. So uh, thank you all. Uh, I'm very uh, excited and I'm very uh, happy for this uh, virtual meeting. Uh, I hope to see you soon <laughs> uh, live. <laughs> I would like to add that, I mean, the, the, the book notwithstanding the very uh, process of this collaboration, as of them so nicely described it, is a, uh, is a very nice example, actually is a, a, a model 
of, of, of how international collaboration uh, should be, and especially international collaboration over a past that was essentially shared. So uh, this, this would be a very a nice and useful model of how to proceed as historians uh, to, to study in common uh, both comparatively and uh, how to say it uh, intensively uh, points of this uh, of this past to share as uh, in the two coasts of the Aegean and even uh, further and uh, so yes I, I should say that we have uh, thankfully a lot of such examples uh, in the last uh, years, but uh, this one is is especially has proven proven especially fruitful and uh, uh, and uh, this this excellent book is is a living proof of what we can uh, make out of out of this. So if there's nothing else, okay, we've been here for a couple of hours, very productive ones, and very interesting. Uh, so thank you all for, uh, for being here in this fascinating discussion. And uh, thank you, Lida and uh, Erdem, for uh, producing this uh, wonderful book. We uh, are all so grateful uh, to you. So on behalf of the Institute of the Mediterranean Indian Studies, I thank you all for participating and uh, hope to see you soon in another uh, either Zoom or even better uh, real real life uh, meeting here at Resino.